It's time for America Outdoors Radio, the show that covers the outdoor scene across the U.S. of A. and the entire continent. Fishing, hunting, conservation, outdoor recreation, and great destinations, we cover it all every week. It's your country, your outdoors. Let's explore it together with your host, John Cruz. Welcome aboard. You know we've got to start things off with the results of the 2019 Bassmaster Classic. It took place on the Tennessee River near Knoxville, Tennessee this year. And the winner, none other than Ott Defoe, who is literally the hometown bass fishing hero. He won it all, fishing his home river. In three days, he weighed in a shade over 49 pounds of bass, beating second place angler Jacob Wheeler by almost four pounds. The Classic is known as the Super Bowl of fishing tournaments, and it drew a hefty crowd, nearly 154,000 people this year. Defoe's prize winnings from the Classic, they're pretty hefty too, totaling some 300 grand. Wow! That wasn't the only show in the Volunteer State either. Held in conjunction with the Bassmaster Classic was the Bassmaster High School Classic. This took place on Tennessee's Watts Bar Lake, and the winners representing Headland High School in Alabama were Gracie Herbold and Aaron Cherry. This young man and woman found five bass weighing just over 16 and a half pounds, which won them the championship title. Oh, and in case you were wondering, the College Bassmaster Classic was held at Watts Bar Lake, too. The winners, Cole Sanders and Bailey Fain from Bryan College, whose 13-pound, 11-ounce limit of five bass was actually less than the high school champion's weight, but still enough for those first-place college bragging rights. Our congratulations go out to all of these fine anglers. This week on the show, we are going to chat with Nelson Siegelman. He's the author of a new book called Martha's Vineyard Fish Tales. It turns out there is some pretty good public access on this well-known Massachusetts island and some pretty good saltwater fishing, too, whether you're fishing in the surf or dropping a line from a boat. After we talk to Nelson about catching stripers and bluefish and more, we'll talk to Keith Crowley. He wrote a book, too, about a subject near and dear to my heart, It's called Pheasant Dogs, and there are some great photos, as well as some great info about the dogs we love to hunt with between the covers of this new book. Keith will join us to tell you about the strengths different breeds of dogs bring when it comes to pheasant hunting. One place to go pheasant hunting is in the state of Nebraska, and the town of Sydney, Nebraska, was once a bit of a pilgrimage stop for hunters and anglers alike who for years made it a point to stop by the big Cabela's store there, back when there was only one of them. Now, of course, Cabela's has been bought out by Bass Pro Shops, and the corporate jobs that were in Sydney are largely gone. But a group of former Cabela's employees are starting a new company that includes an online retail store, and they have plans to eventually open a brick-and-mortar store in Sydney, too, with hopes of revitalizing their hometown. The name of the company is High Bee Outdoors, and Jamie Dykeman, who works there, will tell you more about what they're doing and why you should check them out at highbeeoutdoors.com. Before we talk East Coast fishing, Midwest sporting goods retailers, and pheasant dogs, though, we need to tell you about one heck of a party coming to Boise, Idaho, that you, as a hunter or an angler, are going to want to attend. Our first guest today is Lan Tawny. He is the president and CEO of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, and he's joining us to tell you about the annual rendezvous. Lan, great to have you back on the air. John, it's always a pleasure, man. So last year, the rendezvous was in Boise, Idaho at the convention center. It was a great venue. It was a ton of fun. I understand it's coming back again this year, May 1st through the 4th. Absolutely. We had such a good time down in Boise that we're coming back for our second year. And we learned a lot of things last year, so it's going to be bigger and better this year. Now, it was pretty big last year. How many people attended the seminars and all the other events that were going on there? Yeah, so we had folks come from every single state and almost every single province up in Canada. Um, That was 1,300 people. So that was for the entire weekend. And then at our brew fest that we had on Friday night, we had over 5,000 people. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. I remember, what was it, four years ago in Spokane, I thought the organization was on fire with, what, 350 attendees or so? 
Yeah, you're about right. And we were feeling real good at that point. And this thing just continues to grow. Well, speaking of growing, uh, the, the membership numbers continue to skyrocket as well. You hit a milestone last year of 25,000 people, but you're already way past that as we roll into the, the second quarter of 2019. Absolutely. We're, we're at 34,000 now. And I'm super excited about that. And not just that we're growing that membership, but also that we're using that for good. You know, we've helped pass the largest public lands bill in uh, over a decade. And so these folks are fired up and doing stuff, not just numbers. Uh, and folks, if you were not aware already, backcountry hunters and anglers, uh, they really are the voice for public lands protection, public lands access for sportsmen and women throughout the nation. Uh, If you like to fish, if you like to hunt on public lands, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is an organization you should check out and probably join. Getting back to the rendezvous, though, let's run through the schedule of events. I know May 1st is mainly leadership training for all the chapters you have in North America, but on the 2nd, uh, the Brewfest is back on Thursday night, and man, oh man, that was popular last year. Absolutely. You know, we're going to have some good bands there, and uh, the breweries were super excited about the attendance last year, so we have even more breweries this year and cideries, and I think there's a couple wineries as well, and we're going to have a bunch of food trucks, and it's just really a good time to come together, and so we're super excited about that. So let's move on to Friday. I remember last year in the convention center, there was a couple of things going on. There was lots of booths for BHA and and tables out in the lobby itself. And then there was a section of the convention center that was almost like a mini sportsman show that had about 40 vendors in there. And then there were all of these seminars. And man, the rooms were packed hearing from some of the best known outdoorsmen and women in the nation that were sharing their expertise. Yeah, so, um, you know, you described it well this year. Our our booth space is up to 75, so 75 of our corporate partners and then also some others. So that'll be awesome. And then this year our seminars are just crazy. we got folks doing rattlesnake safety. we got Randy Newberg uh, doing two seminars. we got a seminar on CWD. Uh, Corey Jacobson is going to be doing some elk calling. Ryan Callahan is going to be having a couple of seminars. Um, Eduardo Garcia is going to be there with Traeger uh, giving out, like, little um, tastes of uh, his food and so you know it's going to be jam-packed not only friday but saturday as well so we got the seminars going on but there's a couple of uh other things that are going on too one involves food one involves campfires and one is one heck of a podcast break those down yeah so friday night um you know we're continuing with our public land owner film fest and that's going to be awesome. Last year, I think we had 50 submissions. This year, we had over 200. Wow. And so that'll be a good time. And then right after that, we lead into a live uh, podcast with Meat Eater, none other than Stephen Ranella. So Stephen Ranella will be on stage, as well as uh, Ryan Callahan, Ben O'Brien, myself. And we'll, have, we'll do a live podcast, which we're super excited about. Next morning, Saturday morning, starts early. <laughs> and at 6.30 in the morning, we do like this hike the hunt. So folks are going to be going up to the top of table rock and um last year i think we had about 100 people that went we're expecting you know at least triple that this year and then we do we move into this wild game cook-off which is awesome and and so our chapters from all across the country and up in uh, canada come together test their best kind of backcountry uh cooking skills and then we have judges judge that and uh last year uh the folks that won uh, were from uh, nevada and they had poached uh, sheet balls and so like <laughs> like just eat some crazy stuff while you're there um and then that night you know we get into storytelling and our storytelling this year like i'm super super excited about it and, you know, it's really, uh, we've got Eduardo Garcia, we've got Senator Martin Heinrich uh, from New Mexico. We've got uh, a couple of women, that, like a, a woman that uh, works for us, Katie DeLorenzo, which I'm super excited about. I've heard her story, and it's awesome. Uh, Ryan Callahan's taking the stage again for us, um, so that'll be good. And then a couple others, like Ashley Curtinbach from South Dakota, Elin from uh, Colorado, uh, Jenny Lee from up in British Columbia. So... That is like the culmination of the whole thing, and who doesn't like listening to a story around a campfire at night? Bottom line, folks, it's going to be one heck of a party, and it's meant for you as a hunter and an angler. Tickets are on sale now, and the place to go to get them is backcountryhunters.org. That's backcountryhunters.org. Go to the tab for the BHA Rendezvous. Get your tickets now. Book your hotel reservations and join us in Boise. I think it's going to be another great event. Land, thanks for sharing this with us today on America Outdoors Radio. John, thank you so much and uh, have a great weekend.
We've been telling you about Sportsman's Cove Lodge in Southeast Alaska for a while now, and there's a reason. They are the only Alaska Lodge we talk about in this show. It's because they're truly Alaska's best lodge. The adventure starts with a float plane ride from Ketchikan, after which you'll get the chance to experience some of the best hospitality, food, and wonderful people you'll ever meet. Wildlife is abundant, from bears and deer to eagles and whales, and let's not forget the reason you're here, the fishing. Halibut, salmon, lingo, Cod, rockfish, true cod, and more. It's all waiting for you in abundance at Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Book your trip today at alaskasbestlodge.com. That's alaskasbestlodge.com for Sportsman's Cove Lodge. There's a place where the fishing is year-round, where the sun shines 300 days a year. The wineries and breweries are right downtown. The hiking and cycling offer spectacular views you just don't get in the big cities. Fortunately, the place is real and vibrant. It's the Dalles, Oregon, just 90 short minutes from Portland, along the gorgeous Columbia River, where the adventures are limited only by your imagination. Find out more at explorethedalles.com. Game changing. That's the best way to describe the new Scent Flash UV Triangle Flasher from Max Lure Company. This 360 degree rotational inline flasher features a scent release system attracting salmon to the lure behind it like no other flasher on the market. Soak the free scent pad with any type of oil or gel, or load up the cavity with any type of bait for fishing success beyond your wildest dreams. It's the Scent Flash UV Triangle Flasher, only from Max Lure Company. We're back with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz, and our next guest is coming to us from Martha's Vineyard in the state of Massachusetts. His name is Nelson Siegelman. He's got a brand new book out called Martha's Vineyard Fish Tales. It's published by Stackpole Books, and I think you're going to love it. Nelson, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. So, Nelson, Martha's Vineyard. I thought this was just an enclave for the rich and the famous. For our listeners who don't know exactly where is it, and is there public access available if somebody wants to visit with a rod and reel in hand? Well, John, there's no question that we have lots of rich and famous people come here, but it's also a sort of island of hardworking, middle-class, lower-class folks. I'll give you a quick geography lesson. Martha's Vineyard's three miles south of Cape Cod, it's about 100 square miles. It's about 23 miles long and 9 miles wide. And when I blast out of my house to go and fish at a place called Lobsterville Beach, which is at the other end, it takes me about 35 minutes to get there. So uh, in a practical sense, I could be in on a striped bass in a pretty short time. I like that. I like that. But getting back to the public access question, uh, is the whole island and all the beaches tied up, or can you actually get down there and get to some good fishing? Same thing goes with boat launches. Sure. Well, there's a lot of public access on Martha's Vineyard now. We have a lot of private beaches. Wealthy folks who refer to certainly don't uh, give you the key. But we have a number of conservation organizations that have bought up land. So really, in, in my book, I identify 33 places that are easily fished. And th- that's really a short list because I didn't include those places that where there's sort of informal access where, uh, you know, a tackle shop would send you, but I didn't feel right putting those locations in the book because it's not absolutely public. But really, there's quite a bit of access all around the island. And the nice thing is the variety of places that you can fish from long sandy beaches to really classic rocky shoreline, the sort of thing you'd see in a you know poster of a New England fishing spot. Well, let's talk about some of the fishing opportunities available, Uh, whether you're a shore angler or whether you've got a small boat or whether you're going out for a day on a charter. And I guess we'll start off with the the most famous of the fish that you can catch there, the stripers, the striped bass. The striped bass is the fish on Martha's Vineyard. We have quite a variety of fish here, but really it's the bass that is associated with the vineyard. It's been that way for a long time. More than 100 years ago, you had these clubs that all along New England. They were striped bass clubs, and people would go to them, the people of wealth and privilege. Now anyone can uh, sort of find a bass. And uh, really, I think that striped bass fly fishing is quite popular on the island, as is uh, surf casting. 
And it, it's just nothing like it. You know, the beauty of the striped bass is that you can be standing in uh, about three feet of water and hooking a fish that's 30 pounds. Wow. And it's going to just take you right out. So that's, that's really quite exciting. And a lot of this fishing is done at night, but you'd be amazed how quickly you become acclimated to it. Something else that looks very addicting is casting for bluefish. I've never caught, never even seen a bluefish before, but uh, from the pictures in your book, they certainly look like they got a lot of teeth and they got a bad temper. They've got a lot of attitude. I mean, it's just the perfect fish for anybody that's new to fishing because they strike with abandon. They're really exciting. Uh, they'll jump out of the water. They're very powerful. And when you hit a school of bluefish, you can just put a hook onto a broomstick and throw it out there and pretty much hook up. It's really exciting. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll just take the hook off the plug and throw the plug out and just watch them chase it. It's great fun. <laughs> and it's a good way to uh, bring fish in. To, uh, if you have some people who are fly fishing, bring the fish in closer. But a lot of fun. We get a lot of bluefish around, particularly in the spring. And they're also quite good to eat. I like to uh, fillet them and then smoke them. I was going to ask about the, uh, the the table fare of the bluefish, and I've got the same question about the next two fish I want to ask you about that you talk about in your book, false albacore and bonito. Well, yes. <laughs> when you talk about table fare, the bonito is just great. It's essentially a small tuna, and it's delicious. False albacore, we call them albies here on the island. It's just one of the most exciting fish you can catch. They are so fast and so powerful. If you don't have 300 yards of line on your reel, you're gonna, you may just watch that uh, spool just empty. But I have yet to find anybody that tells me they like eating false albacore. So most people just release them right back into the water. I suppose if you're hard up for cat food, you might uh, keep a, <laughs> keep an albi. But generally speaking, I don't know of anyone that's found a good way to cook them. You know, out on the West Coast, we have the American Shad, and a lot of folks feel the same way about them because they're so oily, but a lot of folks out here will use shad for crab bait, sturgeon bait. Do people use the albies for, for bait out there on the East Coast, maybe for crabbing? Well, so the lobstermen will use them, but the other thing about the albies, we really have about a three-week run of false albacore, sometimes a little bit longer, and they are so tough to hook. Something about them when they get up here, I know they, they catch them further down south and they're not as uh, picky, but both false albacore and bonito, you can be in the middle of them and just not hook up. It's, it's really something, but it's what makes it quite challenging, and it's really exciting fishing. Pretty much it's a fall fishery on the vineyard. Now, you've got several other fisheries available, too. There's sea bass, there's sand sharks, uh, and you've also got fluke, which essentially is a flounder with teeth. Flounder with teeth. They're called summer flounder. It's, uh, we're, now we're in the fish and chips territory. They're a lot of fun to catch. Mostly you're going to catch them from a boat, and uh, it's just you need a good drift. But they're really a lot of fun, and they'll average about four or five pounds, but every now and then you can catch a, a large one, which is going to be about nine or ten pounds. And they haven't been as plentiful as they have in past years, but it's still a, a great midsummer fishery, and that's often what the people will be targeting, say, in late July or August. And it's a great fishery for kids. You just take them out, drift, and, and bounce the bottom. But you have to be on the bottom if you're going to catch them. Well, we've got about a minute left, and I think we have uh, given people the idea that they ought to go to Martha's Vineyard with that rod and reel in hand uh, for all these fisheries and the public access that's available. But let's talk about your book and why it's a great resource for people who are going to go. Well, I wrote this book because I wanted to answer a lot of the questions I've heard in tackle shops over the years. Or when I was writing a regular fishing column, people would send me emails and ask me about fishing on the vineyard. But I wanted a book that would also be sort of have a universal application. So I think, you know, the vineyard, people see all this uh, Hollywood stuff about the vineyard. It misrepresents the island. This is a great family spot. It's a wonderful place to uh, just enjoy a week or two two-week vacation, 
Yes, it's expensive, but the fishing's great, and you can find the spot to fish away from the crowd and really have a, just a wonderful time. And I think the book provides all the information anyone would need who was going to come to the vineyard and wanted to wet a line. I'll tell you what, Nelson, the, the book's a great read because it's not only a reference book, but it's also a, a book that's got a lot of great fishing tales in it, mainly because you were the columnist there for so long and you've got all sorts of stories of the locals to intersperse between all the information about how to catch fish and all of that good stuff. How can people get their hands on a copy of your new book, Martha's Vineyard Fish Tales? Well, they can purchase it through Amazon, or they can go to my website, marthasvineyardoutdoors.com, and just let me know uh, what they'd like me to put on the inside cover, and I'll sign it over to them. So uh, a couple of ways to do that, and yes, I think it's a fun read, and I hope your listeners enjoy it if they pick up a copy. All right, one more time with your website, Nelson. It's marthasvineyardoutdoors.com. Don't let the Boston accent fool you. It's spelled <laughs> just like I said it, marthasvineyardoutdoors, all one word, dot com. All right, that's the place to go for an autographed copy, and that's always the best kind of copy to get. But if you're in a hurry, you can order it through Amazon.com as well. Nelson, thanks for sharing your fishing world with us here on America Outdoors Radio. Thank you very much. Are you looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here for you. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer affordable platforms to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting John Cruz through his website at americaoutdoorsradio.com. That's americaoutdoorsradio.com. Hurry, though. If you wait too long, the big opportunity might just get away. americaoutdoorsradio.com. You're back in with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz, and we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, pheasant hunting dogs. A man named Keith Crowley has written a book called Pheasant Dogs. It is a beautiful hardcover book that is put out by Wild River Press. It is brand new, and if you love dogs and if you love pheasant hunting, you're going to love this book. With us here to tell you more about it is Keith. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, John. I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I'm always happy to talk about hunting dogs. Let's talk a little bit about your book before we talk dogs. Again, the, the layout and the photography in particular is beautiful, and you talked to a whole bunch of pheasant dog owners in this book. Yep, I sure did. I, I really tried to mix up the type of people that I talked to. I have some professional trainers in the book. I have a wildlife biologist. I talked to a veterinarian. Uh, and then there's some first-time dog owners, too. Let's talk a little bit about breeds, because that's really what this book is about, is the different breeds that are pheasant dogs. And let's talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses you discovered about them uh, while you wrote this book, because... There's some folks out there listening today who are either looking at their dog and thinking, you know, you've only got a couple years left. I've got to start thinking about a new one or are maybe thinking, I want to go pheasant hunting with a dog. Because as you and I know, Keith, there's no finer thing in the world than upland bird hunting with dogs, is there? Yeah, I agree completely. In fact, that was one of the questions I asked every single person I interviewed for the book was, would you hunt? for pheasants in particular, but would you keep hunting upland birds if you couldn't have a dog? And not surprisingly, everyone pretty much said, no, the dog is what makes it magical out there. The birds are kind of secondary, and especially the older hunters, they, they get to a point where they'd rather watch the dog work, and they're more happy with a fine performance in the field from their dog than they are with fine shooting or huge numbers of birds or anything like that. It's really all about the dog work. I understand. Unfortunately, I'm starting to get to that age where I'm starting to feel that way, though. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy you to knock down a limit of pheasants whenever I can. Absolutely. Let's start off with what is probably the most common breed that you see out there in the, in the cornfields and other places you'll find pheasant. That would be the <laughs> Labrador Retriever. Strengths and weaknesses, in your opinion, when it comes to this breed. I know you've owned some labs. 
Yep, I'm a lab guy right now. I've got my uh, my 12 year old lab is sitting next to me right now as as we record this. Labs are kind of the most versatile breed that I found for myself, and I think a lot of people agree. You can use them in a whole wide variety of different situations, whether you're hunting pheasants or ducks or or rough grouse or even some guys I know use them as as retrievers for quail and. I guess a Labrador is just kind of the, the multi per, it's a Swiss army dog. Let's put it that way. You can use them for just about anything out there. They can tolerate heat. They can tolerate cold. They don't mind charging through those December cattails, uh, the snow choke cattail sloughs and, and you can hunt them in, uh, in mid October in the high grass of the prairie regions too. They do everything pretty well. They don't really specialize except for retrieving. Of course, they are Labrador retrievers. They're pretty much the best, for my money, the best retrieving breed out there. You know, I think you summed up the, that breed perfectly. I've, I've owned a yellow lab myself, and I loved hunting with him. His name was Sage. Uh, but I've moved on to a Springer Spaniel now, and I know you started with a Springer Spaniel. Uh, I'm finding this is a very interesting breed to work with. I agree completely. My first two dogs were both Springers. I love the breed. I love the way they naturally quartered uh, in front of me, I, through no effort of my own teaching them this, they just seem to instinctually know to stay within gun range and to work back and forth in front of me. And if I was with a group of five guys, the dogs, both the springers I had, would, would naturally just quarter in front of the group, always staying in gun range. I will always have a soft spot in my heart for, uh, for Springer Spaniels. They're almost as versatile as Labradors. I, I'm not sure they're quite as good a duck dog, although my Springers both retrieved a lot of waterfowl in their day. I switched eventually because I got tired of pulling burrs out of them after every <laughs> hunt, quite frankly. Uh, you, you'd spend a, a long time, especially on their ears trying to get all the cockle burrs out after a day in the field. Well, I think that's why a lot of folks like pointers, whether they're English pointers or other pointer breeds. Uh, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses you'll find there besides the, the lack of birds you have to pull out at the end of the day? <laughs> yeah, I, gotta, I should step back and say, too, that, you know, the English setters uh, share that particular malady with English Springers. It, unless you cut all the feathering off them, they're just going to, they're burr magnets. They, yes, they, they are. can't help but be. Uh, but the pointing breeds obviously tend to want to run bigger, whether it's an English pointer or a German short hair or even some of the wire hairs, the, the Drothars and uh, the Griffins and some of those dogs. They, they want to run a little bit bigger. Uh, they cover more ground. And they tend to do very well in hot climates because of the, the shorter hair, especially English pointers in particular. That's why you see them in the south a lot, uh, is they're well designed to, to shed heat. And so early season, I, I have friends who run labs and pointers, and they tend to run their pointers early in the season. And then when the snow hits and the, the cattail mar marshes get full of snow, then they switch to their retrievers. It all depends on your style of hunting. You know, pointing guys, as one of my subjects in the book, Ron Shera, says, pointing guys, they just live for the point. Right. Uh, nothing else really matters. Watching that dog lock up on point is a magical experience. And it is when you see them, you know, they strike that pose and every muscle in their body is tense and they're just quivering with anticipation. It's something to behold, and I understand the appeal of it. It hasn't quite grabbed hold of me enough that I switched breeds myself, but I love hunting behind a good pointer. One last breed I want to talk about, because you interview somebody in the book, Anthony Houck, who works for Pheasants Forever, and he owns a couple of yep. English Cocker Spaniels. I got to hunt with Anthony and his Spaniels in South Dakota last November. Small little dogs, but wonderful hunters. <laughs> Aren't they amazing dogs? You know, it's deceptive because they're so small. I think Anthony's dogs weigh, you know, around 20 pounds. And when they're carrying back a big rooster pheasant, that bird looks as big as those dogs. It's remarkable. But, you know, he made some really good points in the book about those dogs being able to go places other dogs can't. I interviewed a gentleman, um, John Haugland, who breeds Chesapeake Bay Retrievers, and he had a completely different theory on hunting snow choke cattails late in the season. You know, he wants his dog to 
bust through those cattails and just go, 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 just stormtrooper through stuff. Uh, Anthony likes to see his dogs work through those little tunnels that the birds have created, and his little cockers get down there and, and just root around, and they are good at going places big dogs can't seem to get. Well, Keith, we are unfortunately out of time, but before we go, uh, let's steer folks to where they can buy your brand new book, Pheasant Dogs. Sure, they can go to the publisher, Wild River Press. And there's a website set up specifically for the book where they can see excerpts. Uh, they can see some of the photos. It's a very photo-heavy book. There are hundreds of photos in the book. Most of them are mine, but also the subjects contributed photos as well. So there's a really wide variety of photos in there. And they just have to go to www.pheasantdogsbook.com. And they can uh, they can see what's what's in the book and get a feel for how it would look if they it arrives on their doorstep. It's a big book. It, I've heard it called a coffee table book, but it's really not uh, a coffee table book, so to speak. It's large format, large photos, but I wouldn't call it a coffee table book. Well, it's a beautiful book. I will say that with some great photos, some great stories. Again, it's Pheasant Dogs, Stories from the Field, Hunters, Trainers, and Trailers by Keith Crowley. Brand new book. I think you're going to love it. Again, the website to go to, pheasantdogsbook.com. That's pheasantdogsbook.com. Keith, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom about dogs with us today on America Outdoors Radio. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk about dogs, and it was a pleasure talking with you, John. If you're going to shell out the money to go to Alaska on a fishing adventure, You want the best experience possible, don't you? That's why you should log on to alaskasbestlodge.com. That's the home for Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Located in southeast Alaska, this lodge offers incredible fishing, wonderful customer service, great accommodations, and food that you won't believe. Better still, they are offering an end-of-season special. You will arrive on September 6th. You'll fish for four days. And at the end of that fourth day, instead of taking that float plane back to Ketchikan that afternoon, you'll stay an extra night. That's right. You get a free night because it's the last trip of the season, and you will get all that great food and experience those wonderful accommodations and the solitude and tranquility that is offered at Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Keep your eyes out for wildlife. Get your rod in the water for some salmon, some halibut, some cod, some rockfish, and more. Sportsman's Cove Lodge is the place to be for the end of season special and any other time this summer. That Sportsman's Cove Lodge booked their end of season special. Spots are limited. The website again is alaskasbestlodge.com. That's alaskasbestlodge.com. Ask for the end of season special. There's no more majestic, magical, adventuresome country than the western United States of America to enjoy a great family vacation. Hello, I'm Mark Hemstreet, owner of Shiloh Inns. Shiloh Inns are still offering affordable four-star accommodations at two-star prices. Enjoy deluxe smoke-free suites, spacious pools and spas, and fully equipped fitness centers. From free high-speed internet in every room to a free continental breakfast or full hot delicious breakfast at most Shiloh Inns. There are no hidden fees like some of the big chain hotels charge. Even the kids stay free and Shiloh Inns are dog friendly. For reservations, call 1-800-222-2244 or visit our website at shilohinns.com. Shiloh Inns, affordable excellence. American family owned and proud of it. There's a place where the fishing is year-round, where the sun shines 300 days a year. The wineries and breweries are right downtown. The hiking and cycling offer spectacular views you just don't get in the big cities. Fortunately, the place is real and vibrant. It's the Dalles, Oregon, just 90 short minutes from Portland, along the gorgeous Columbia River, where the adventures are limited only by your imagination. Find out more at explorethedalles.com. 
Backcountry hunters and anglers, a nationwide group working to keep public lands in public hands. We've helped ban the use of drones for hunting. We help repair wildlife corridors and key riparian areas. We speak up against illegal ATV use. Please join this dynamic conservation group. Check us out at backcountryhunters.org. Welcome back to America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We've got some outdoors news for you. And unfortunately, we're starting off with the passing of a fishing legend, Daryl Lawrence, founder of Lawrence Electronics, who brought early technology to recreational fishing with the invention of the first portable sonar, quote unquote, fish finder called the Fish Locator for the average angler. Daryl served as president and CEO of Lawrence Electronics from 1964 to 2006 and was responsible for many breakthroughs in marine electronics. In addition to the fish locator, also known as the little green box, he led the development of the first graph recorder, the first integrated sonar GPS unit, and many others. The Lawrence brand was a family business known for the community leadership and was a large Tulsa, Oklahoma employer for many years. Our thanks to the American Sport Fishing Association for sharing a little bit about his legacy. We told you about the Bassmaster Classic when we started off this show, but there's other tournaments that have been going on too recently to include a crappie USA super event that took place at Lakes Marion and Moultrie in Santee, South Carolina. Total of 20 boats fished the Santee Cooper event on March 15th and 16th. 11 of them were in the pro division, 9 in the amateur division. The top spot in the pro event went to Charles Knight Jr. and his son, Charles Knight III, from Camden, South Carolina. They weighed in 30.17 30.17 pounds of crappie in two days of fishing to earn a check for $3,000. Their key to success, black and chartreuse AWD swimming minnows and chartreuse Charlie Brewer sliders fished 12 to 15 feet deep. Meanwhile, in the amateur division, it was a solo angler from Youngstown, Ohio, by the name of Robert Denon, who came out on top, weighing in just over 16 pounds of slab crappie to earn a first place check of 1500 bucks. If you want to find out more about Crappie USA events near you, and maybe take part in one, go to crappieusa.com. Next up on America Outdoors Radio, we're talking with Jamie Dykeman. She's with a company called High Bee Outdoors. Now, High Bee is spelled differently than you think. It's spelled High, H-I-G-B-Y, Outdoors. But it's pronounced High Bee Outdoors, brand new online retailer located in Sydney, Nebraska. And sooner than later, they're going to have a retail store too. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, Jamie, let's start off with the current footprint of High Bee Outdoors, both online and the plans for the retail component in terms of a brick and mortar store. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you mentioned, you know, right now we're a new online outdoor retailer um, and we sell a wide assortment of outdoor products, including firearms, ammunition, shooting accessories, optics, hunting equipment, fishing, and pretty much general outdoors products. That's something we're excited about and definitely passionate about. Futuristically, We look to expand in different avenues to help surface our outdoor customer, including retail. So I think it's very interesting that you're located in Sydney, Nebraska. Now, for years, people went to Sydney, Nebraska to go to the one and only Cabela's store that was there. It was almost like a pilgrimage. And Sydney was the corporate headquarters for Cabela's, too. But as we all know, Cabela's was bought out by Bass Pro Shops. Uh, Just about all of those 2,000 corporate jobs were moved out of Sydney, Nebraska. And you're there now. So did your company move in to Sydney or were you already there? Um, Our company, as far as like the people behind the scenes and really who are making the company what it is, are the roots have always been in Sydney. And have the roots also come from Cabela's? In other words, are the people that work for hy Outdoors, are they, like you, former Cabela's employees from Nebraska? Yep, that is true. All right. Well, tell me a little bit about the owner. Uh, I understand that he's got a very strong background with Cabela's. Yes. Um, the owner, Matt hy as some of you guys know, his father, Dennis hy was one of the founders, I should say, of, of Cabela's. And the legacy hy is is... Very well known, at least where we're at in, in the outdoor industry. That's 
that's something that Matt and, you know, his family is growing up in the outdoors. They live and breathe the outdoor lifestyle. So, you know, the passion and dedication they have for outdoor products, for the lifestyle, and really sharing that with other outdoor advocates, like, that's truly who the Hybees are. Hybee Outdoors today, you're a new company. And again, right now, you're online. I know there are plans to eventually build a retail store in Sydney, but you're an online retailer right now. How big are you? So right now we have a team of roughly 10, 11 people and the product assortment that we have, like I mentioned, is very broad, but we're focusing on, you know, great quality products, um, offering, you know, great prices and really focusing on brands that we feel are great brands and even new innovative products. So from, you know, the shooting category with firearms, ammunition, all the way with hunting and fishing, I'd say right now, when you go and check out our website, you know, the offering that we have is is something we're proud of and we'll continuously, um, improve and try to keep building on. Well, it's a good website, and and there is quite a bit there. I was impressed, especially for a brand new company. What's the dream for High B Outdoors in terms of, you know, pardon the phrase, what do you want to be when you grow up as a company? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we have some, some core things that we're passionate about, right? The customer, for one. Absolutely, the customer is going to be and will always be our foundation and our priority. Um, Along with, you know, we talked about the website and having a convenient, you know, shopping experience. That's something we're very proud of and, you know, really want to always improve on. Um, But ultimately, you know, we we advocate for the outdoors. You know, the Second Amendment, responsible gun ownership. We believe that it's our responsibility, honestly, as an outdoor company to absolutely advocate for that. And it really doesn't matter if you're new to the outdoor industry or have lived these traditions your entire life. Ultimately, we at High Bee Outdoors want to be your welcoming and trusted resource for all your outdoor needs. So just about everybody is going to agree with your vision. It's a great vision. I think all sportsmen can embrace with one exception, and that would be Bass Pro Shop slash Cabela's. I understand they actually filed a lawsuit against your company. Has that been resolved? At this time right now, like all we can say is that we're very pleased, at least with the recent decision of the United States District Court of Delaware to deny Cabela's motion for a preliminary injunction. So at this time, we're uncertain to what Bass Park Bellows intends to do next, um, but we're clear to get started. And that's that's honestly what we're focusing on and just happy to start moving on. Getting back to High Bee Outdoors, one more question I'm going to ask you. There's a lot of online retailers out there, including Cabela's and Bass Pro Shops, but lots of other ones too. Why should they shop from you as opposed to all the other places that sell outdoors products online? No, I think that that's, a, that's an awesome question. And honestly, it comes back to we feel the biggest priority to us is the customer, right? And we have a very high expectation of what great customer service is and what it should be, you know, based on our previous years and just experience in Sydney. And ultimately, that will be our foundation of who we are. So we feel that the level of customer service we're providing has honestly been lost for a while. So that's what we want to get back to. You know, we view our customer as family and whatever they need or you need, we're going to find a way to make it right. Um, We live the outdoor lifestyle as well. So when you call us, you know, people on my team, they use outdoor products. They are end users and are very passionate and knowledgeable about products. So you're not just talking to a customer service rep. You're talking to somebody that uh, truly knows what they're talking about and loves speaking about the outdoors. I love hearing this. And folks, if you haven't typed it in already while you've been listening to this, you probably need to do so. The website again, hybeoutdoors.com. That's spelled H-I-G-H-B-Y outdoors.com. Hybeoutdoors.com. Check them out. And by the time you get to Sydney, Nebraska again, They might have a retail store open. You'll want to check that out, too. Jamie, thanks for telling us about this today on America Outdoors Radio. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, John. Here's hoping that High Bee Outdoors is very successful and that they bring some more prosperity to Sydney, Nebraska. Time is running short, and we've got to wrap things up. But as we've told you before, there's a lot of ways to catch this show. One of them is online every Saturday morning from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern Time on TalkAmericaRadio.us, the new voice of conservative talk radio. You can also listen on demand anytime you want to pass shows at America Outdoors Radio on Stitcher or Podbean. We've got a Facebook page that's also found at America Outdoors Radio. And oh yes, that website too. 
you guessed it, AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com. I do hope that you are blessed in the days ahead, and I do hope we are done with some of this crazy weather we've been seeing the last few weeks. Whether it be snow or floods or tornadoes or more, let's just have a nice spring, shall we? So we can all get out there together and do a little fishing and maybe get out there for some turkey hunting too. Remember, it's your country and you're outdoors, so get out there and enjoy it. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers seeks to ensure North America's outdoor heritage of hunting and fishing through education and work on behalf of wild public lands and waters. Lend your voice to the fight by visiting www.backcountryhunters.org and join the 25,000 men and women who have pledged to defend wildlife and public access. You can also demonstrate your support by signing up for the 2019 North American Rendezvous in Boise, Idaho, May 1st to the 5th.